science enthusiasts. I'm your host, Jason Zakowski. I'm a high school chemistry teacher, but you probably know our dogs, Bunsen and Beaker. They're the science dogs on social media. This show takes what's best from their account, the curiosity and fun found there, and swirls it into podcast form. Every week, we're going to take some deep dive into an area of science and look at the research that's going on with our pets. We'll also have an expert guest who will enthrall you with their area of knowledge. This is The Science Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Science Podcast. We hope you're happy and healthy out there. It's a dreary day outside, um, but the dogs don't care. They're ready to go for a walk at some point today. So if it's still dreary and drizzling and maybe even snowing, well... That's what you got to do as a dog owner, right? You got to take them out there regardless of the weather. Though I think the quote unquote wet cold is maybe more uncomfortable than a dry cold uh, because you get wet and cold rather than just putting on more layers. That's a joke for people on the East Coast and the West Coast of Canada who who always complain that the wet cold is worse than the dry cold. (laughs) All right. What do we have on the show for this week? In science news, we have a physics story about general relativity and teeny tiny measurements. It's actually kind of interesting. To be honest with you, I was teaching, I'm teaching introductory physics right now to my my students in high school. And it, it, I saw the story and I was like, oh, this is perfect. It's perfect timing. In pet science, we're going to talk about a time article that just came out in the Times, you know, magazine that linked together a whole bunch of studies. And we've talked about some of them that basically dispel the old methods of dog training. Our guest and ask an expert is Dr. Chanel Tolson, who is an international public health professional. We're going to get into some really good discussions there. Hey, dogs, did you hear about the two blood vessels that fell in love? Well, alas, it was all in vain. (laughs) That's terrible. All right, on with the show, because there's no time like science time. This week in science news, we're going to talk some really mind-bending physics. Well, space-time bending physics. <laughs> it has to do with general relativity. So a little bit of background, some background information on Einstein's theory of gravity basically st- states that clocks will go a little bit faster the farther they are away from Earth or other massive objects. So gravity slows time the ticking of a clock. The wild part of this story is that the further you are away from Earth could be measured by the height of the clock from Earth. And we're talking about teeny tiny atomic clocks that are just slightly, oh, (laughs) slightly stacked higher than their other clocks closer to the Earth. If Einstein's theory of general relativity is true, every fraction, every tiny little blip away from Earth, the clocks should get a little bit faster. Now, the whole mechanism is really beyond my ability to explain. I'm going to have to get some astrophysicists on here to to help me out. But gravity warps space-time. It creates like a dip in the fabric of our universe. Time kind of gets stuck in that dip or time warps in that dip. It was explained to me that if light is trapped in a gravity well, It needs to use energy to escape the gravity well. So in losing energy, you also lose time. I don't know if that helps, but that's that's how it was explained to me. Now, back to the story, we have we're going to talk about these atomic clocks that are showing differences in time across a millimeter sample of atoms. So we're talking like a millimeter is there's 10 centimeters in a millimeter. I'm not sure what that is for you imperial people, but a centimeter One centimeter is roughly the average width of a baby fingernail, you know, within reason. And so like if you slice that into 10, that's a millimeter. Okay, how how does an atomic clock work? Atoms can, if you can think about an atom like an atom of hydrogen, it can exist at different energy levels. And at different frequencies of light, the energy levels can jump around a bit. And that wiggling of light waves, how when an atom jumps to higher and lower energy states, that's like ticking on these atomic clocks. And I guess you could measure that with really, really specific equipment that measures frequencies of, of light to see this kind of flickering. And, and the idea was that for atoms that are a little bit further away from the ground of the Earth, that flickering is going to be a little bit faster. Um, because time is going to move a little bit quicker. So this new study by physicist Zheng Yi of Gila in Boulder, Colorado, 
They use a clock made of about 100,000 ultra-cold strong team atoms. Uh, if you remember Dora T. Tell, she talked about how as things get colder, they can use those super cold atoms to measure gravity of the Earth. Well, now we're using super cold gra- uh, atoms to measure time. So I guess I guess the kind of standard across physics, you just need to get things super cold. The time difference is you're going to laugh at this. So if it, it's, you're going to laugh at the time difference. Was it noticeably slower? No, no. So after they corrected for all the different possibilities that could be out there that would be creating a time difference, the frequency of this flicker on these atomic clocks changed by a hundredth of a quadrillionth of a percent over a millimeter. So it got slower and they were able to calculate that, but we're talking about the tiniest of difference. And they tracked this ticking, the clock, the atomic clock ticking for days, 90 hours actually, and it became wicked accurate. I won't go into the statistics of it, but it became the most precise frequency comparison ever performed. So that got a lot of physicists super excited. It proved again, general relativity is a thing. And and we can test that general relativity instead of around black holes and stars and planets and even like astronauts that come back to Earth or if we move a, a clock up into space, we're talking about differences of a millimeter. And it's super exciting. Now, an application of this, besides just proving that general relativity exists at tiny, tiny differences, there's some theoretical physicists that are super excited about this because they could use this precision to search for dark matter. Um, we had uh, Sophia Gadnasar on. She talked about how dark matter isn't dark like black. It just means it's, we can't see it and can't detect it. Um, and these tiny, tiny, tiny precise tickings of the clocks may be able to pick it up. The the theory is perhaps dark matter could alter those the ticking. If you scale this out to a big picture, if you've seen the movie Interstellar with Matthew McConaughey, when they go down to that water planet that's around the black hole, time changes for them. Um, time slows for them. Time is f- faster for everybody that's further away from the black hole. And they, that is absolutely true. It's really hard to wrap our heads around because that we would not be able to really experience that. All of the black holes to have, you know, one minute equals tw- seven years or something like that is so far away. Um, but the theory holds true. Tiny, tiny differences in the distance from gravity affects time. Now, if I could only change the gravity around me so I could get more stuff done, hey? <laughs> that's, that's science news for this week. This week in Pet Science, I'm going to talk about the new Time article in Time magazine that was really interesting because it tied together a whole bunch of stuff that we've been talking about on the podcast for the last two years and how Bunsen and Beaker are trained by waggles and red deer under Char's direction, Char Mulligan, um, who we had on uh, Twitter Spaces. And the whole idea is that the science behind dog training is changing. Now, this is no so, not so much a study as in a conversation. I just wanted to highlight some of the things that they talked about in the Time article. Um, you can check it out. I believe it's in the October edition of Time. And the whole idea is that there's this um, alpha theory that was prevalent in training before where you had to dominate over your dog. You had to use... Um, negative reinforcement or, or negative, ne, you know, negative cues, leash corrections, pinch collars, um, scolding, things like that. You had to be the boss. It's been debunked as a way that is the best to train your dog. We talked about the study a couple weeks ago where um, they paired up dogs with positive correction, positive training to um, the negative correction of like shock collars and the dogs that didn't have any negative training techniques did better, retained information better, and were more excited to try new things. They were less fearful. One of the reasons maybe why this is so important and it's, and we're seeing this and I'm sure you are seeing it where you are. And it's kind of sad is that during COVID people got pets. We were trapped in our house. Everything was shut down. Uh, A lot of people could work from home and they got dogs. They got puppies. They got dogs from shelter dogs, which was awesome. But now some dogs are being returned and people just don't know how to train their dog. People go on the internet and maybe they try one method they see on YouTube and it's not working for them. And the other big problem is dogs haven't been able to socialize as easily during COVID. And that's a huge, huge thing that needs to be done 
for puppies especially. Bunsen struggled after he broke his toe. He was, we were taking him to puppy training and we were taking him to socialization classes. And then he randomly broke his toe and he was out for like two to three months. And by the time he was back, his personality had changed. He was more fearful of other dogs. He wasn't as friendly with people. And that was, it was really sad because he was such an outgoing, happy guy and he still loves us. He's still like, he's, he's still pretty outgoing, but I think when he was, when his formative years, that really changed his personality and he's definitely not as outgoing as Beaker is. The Time Magazine found another interesting study that I, I didn't come across, but it was talking about how guide dog training has changed and they, they, by moving to a more positive reinforcement training, click, like clicker training and um, praise training. They train the dogs for people who are blind in half the time, and they're able to stay with their person for longer because they're less stressed out. There is some pushback to positive reinforcement, and it maybe comes from the professions of dogs that need aggression. So we're talking about military dogs and police dogs. So that's a bit of a controversy right now is that they, some of those trainers feel that you need the dog to have that negative reinforcement and other trainers are like, well, no, if it works for a guide dog, it should work for your military dog. I, I love this one idea that Char gave uh, us for Bunsen and Beaker. And we use it when the dogs go outside, they have to sit. And if a dog is scratching at the door to go outside, you can like, especially if they've gone pee or poop and you've taken them for a walk and they're just trying to go outside. The old adage was you would ignore the dog. So that's, you know, you're not rewarding the behavior. But what she said is like, why not use this as a way to train the dog? So if they're scratching at the door, you re- you, you say, now we're going to work. You get them to go sit somewhere and uh, do do some training. A lot of dogs crave that. So Bunsen has toddler time and toddler time generally goes away when we give him attention, but it also goes away when we put him to work, like doing treat, tr- you know, tricks for treats and reviewing cues. We're working on bow, which is kind of tricky. <laughs> and uh, I know toddler time is really high if he hasn't been exercised and his brain hasn't been stimulated. Um, Beaker's good to you know, give her like a puzzle toy and she'll solve that. But Bunsen, Bunsen likes to have some kind of job before he goes to sleep at night. The most popular training techniques now are positive reinforcement. Like you can get your dog to do the thing with negative reinforcement, but you can also get the dog to do the thing with positive training. And it all comes down to making a stronger bond with you as the handler, as the companion, as the parent of the dog. And the studies overwhelmingly show that with positive training and, and praise training and clicker training for treats, this the bond with the handler becomes stronger over time. And that's adorable. That's Pet Science for this week. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to our show week after week. If you want to know how to support the Science Podcast, here are a couple ways. It's always going to be free to download, so you'll never have to worry about paying for it. But, you know, things do cost money running a podcast, and and here are a couple ways you could help us out. One is join our Patreon page. It's amazing. It's growing. It's almost like an extended family. There's multiple tiers of support, and we have lots of fun perks for being part of our Patreon page. The other way you could support us is giving us an awesome review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, anywhere you can rate our podcast. Give us a great review. The third way you could support the show is checking out the Bunsen Burner BMD.com website. We have awesome merch there. We worked really hard finding quality merchandise that's comfortable with vibrant colors. And you'll find in limited quantities over the next couple months, maybe even less, the 2022 Bunsen and Beaker calendar. So three ways to support us. The Patreon page. Two, give us a great review. Three, head over to our merch stop and see if there's anything there you'd like. Thanks, everybody. Now on to the interview section. It's time for Ask an Expert on the Science Podcast. And I am thrilled to have Dr. Chanel Tolson, who's a scientist, but also a public health professional. How are you doing today, Chanel? I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> Yay, I'm excited to talk to you. I'm so glad you said yes. Um, we have some uh, some questions for you that we'll get to in a second. But first off, um, where are you in the world? Where are you calling into the podcast from? So I'm not Canadian. I am from <laughs> the U.S. And I am in the great state of Maryland, which is oh. not too far from D.C. <laughs> right, right. From D.C., not B.C., right? 
Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I thought you said BC God. and I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Um, <laughs> that, that's hilarious. Um, I talked, one of our last guests was from Maryland as well. It's a, it's one of the smallest states, isn't Small it? Small worlds. Yes, it is. It is. Yeah. It's a very small state. You can drive across it in like an hour or two. Yeah, that's what the guest said. If you have to drive more than two hours, you need to pack a sandwich or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is Maryland your home? Like, were you did you were you born in Maryland? Is Maryland where you're from, or if you are you from somewhere else? I uh, am from Maryland. Born oh, and raised. cool! Oh, born look at that! Here. Look at that! Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yep. <laughs> now, um, I mentioned you're a scientist. What was your educational journey like? How did you get into all of that? So. The easiest way to explain it is I have always been interested in the sciences. You know, I was a very curious kid, a pretty precocious kid, but always very, very <laughs> curious as well. And so um, I don't know if, if Canadians can um, relate to the colloquialism, but it, we're also from a very rural part of Maryland, so very country. Mm. And so my grandfather was, since I was knee-high to a grasshopper. <laughs> so since I was very, very small, I've always been interested in the sciences. So I would be outside and playing because, you know, when I was a kid, we played outside a lot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mud pies and, you know, running down by the creek and looking at, you know, the the little uh, tadpoles and whatnot that are, you know, swimming by. So I was always, you know, tinkering around with stuff. And then I wanted to pretend I had a microscope. And then I wanted to look at things. And then I'm like, well, what is this made out of? Can I make this? And I was always doing these things. And so it's always really, really um, it's been innate. I've always just kind of been inquisitive. Most kids are. And then they just fostered it. You know, my grandma's like, well, okay, if she likes it, let's see where it goes. And then here I am. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's how it happened from, from knee high to a grasshopper. So through high school, what, uh, and then into university, what was yeah. your, what was your education there? I'm just curious. So I actually, when I got into high school, we had, uh, you can choose a path, right? Because mm -hmm. in preparing for college, um, we have what's called the AP exams. Yeah, AP, so you bet. The, you have that. Okay, so yeah, the advanced placements. And so I chose the biology track there. And then by taking the test, I was able to place out of the beginner's biology and move ahead and get the credits for college, which was great. And so in undergrad, I was a biology major. So uh, dual bachelor's there, biology and molecular biology, biochemistry and bioinformatics. And then from there, I moved on to get a master's degree and I chose science education the molecular biology route. And then from there, I moved into public health and I have a doctor of public health and I focused on global health, infectious diseases, capacity building and things of the sort. So, and I kind of have a feeling you're going to ask me next. So I'm just going to go into it. People, you know, they ask, well, science education and then public health and then being a scientist, like, how was that all connected? Like what made you do that? Yeah. And so being, being a scientist, right. That's always been something I wanted to do. I can't picture myself doing anything else. Like, if I wasn't a scientist, what would I be? I had no idea. I really <laughs> don't know. So I'm, I'm a scientist, but in going the education route, I was thinking not just as far as education, but also training. So a part of science and also communication, a part of being a scientist is not just being able to do the work, but when it comes to relaying that information, it's super important to be able to reach your audience. Mm -hmm. So right now, as a science communicator, right, which is how we kind of found each other, right now, what I do is I take complex science concepts and I'm able to relay them to a non-science audience. And that's super important, especially in this time with COVID, because oh, a lot man. of this information is out there. But it's, it's really important to not just be able to do the work, but to be able to explain it to somebody else. Because how easy is it to tell somebody, hey, you know what? Wearing a mask reduces your exposure to droplets, right? That's super easy to say versus me saying, well, the droplets are 0 0.01 micrometers. And if you, in <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, it's so much easier to explain it to somebody in a, in a language they can understand. So that's where the education part comes into play. And, so did, do you, also, did you like public speaking? Like a lot of science communication is, of course, like writing, right? And being uh, succinct. And um, did you did you stand in front of people and talk about stuff and found that you were you had some skill there? So, you know, what really did it for me? I don't, I'm not sure how it works um, in, in other families, but it, when you are. When you are the scientist in your family, <laughs> everyone asks you everything. They assume like you're, you know everything, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter what the topic is. They think you know everything. <laughs> and so um, part of my journey, because my parents couldn't afford to send me to college and pay for it, I had to, you know, 
take out lots of loans, but I also had to work. And so I worked three jobs undergrad and all three oh, jobs man. were in pharmacies. I was a pharmacy technician. So I knew pharmacy inside and out. So whenever the older people in my family had a problem with their medication, they would call me. And so they're asking me all these questions. I'm like, you know, what well, didn't your doctor tell you? And so after talking <laughs> to them, they're like, you explained it so much better than they did. And I'm like, really? Aww, that's cute. And, and so, but that's what happened. And so over and over and over again, people kept telling me, you're really good at explaining this. Why yeah. didn't the doctor just say this? Or why didn't so-and-so just say it that way? I'm like, I have no idea. And so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a that skill. It's such an important skill, right? And and not to <laughs> knock people that don't have it. That's why we need amazing people like you. We need amazing science communicators in the world. Oh, thank you. Yeah, like do you? I've I've said this before to some other science communicators I've talked talked to, and I, I kind of pose this question. I'll pose it to you too. Do you feel that we the science has um is playing catch up to the misinformation? We just don't have enough science communicators everywhere? So, you know what I really think? Um, I think that, and this may be a little bit um, of an unpopular opinion, right? That's okay. I think that when it comes to science, when it comes to the medical community, and when it comes to misinformation, I really wish the public could see scientists for who they are, and they're human, right? But I also wish that the public could grant a little bit more grace in these terms. And here's why. Typically, when we talk about science innovation and things like vaccines or um, R&D, research and development, mm -hmm. when it comes to doing medications and whatnot, they take years and years and years of research before we come with, with a, a final product, right? And there's lots of back and forth. And there's lots of, hey, I don't agree with you. Or, hey, this lab found this. This lab found that. And we just don't agree. And it takes years of those conversations and that back and forth to happen before a final general consensus can come out and we make a decision on that, right? That's typically how science works. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing right now is all of that back and forth, that bickering and directives changing from, you know, as more information comes in, we're seeing that happen in real time. And the public is not used to seeing that because it's been behind closed doors. We've had time to get these things together. Well, right now, the pandemic, this is a global pandemic. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. So we really don't have the time to do the research behind closed doors. It's really like, you know, on the move, like day to day, it's changing. And the more data we get, the more research being done, the more info we receive, that changes the directives as far as public health is concerned. And so I, I really wish that the public would give a little bit more grace and understand that, yes, unfortunately, things are changing. You know, you, one day it's this, one day it's that. But as more data, newer data comes in, the directives have to match the data that's found. So we don't so that we're on top of it. Yeah, and it just seems that it's, it's happening in real time now. Yeah, that's tough for the general public to wrap their head around, isn't it? Hey, that science is fluid. Yeah. Um, science change like sci like if you yourself like let's say Chanel w wakes up tomorrow and you can fly. I mean, there's going to be a lot of changes to physics because of that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, exactly. so science as soon as there's new information, everything can change, and that and yes. you know that's really tough right now when the the spotlight is on science. And scientists are like, this is what happens. Like, this. And it's tough to get that across, eh? <laughs> yeah. And then people see that as, oh, no, they don't know what they're talking about. It's like, yeah, no, exactly. It's not, oh. not really what it is. It's just that you're seeing it in real time. This yeah. is the scientific process. Yeah. Well, and scientists probably really didn't know what they were talking about at the start of the pandemic. We're like, we don't actually know. We got to, you know, because it's a new virus. So they, they were right. there. That that was also a little bit frustrating from from my perspective. We're like, okay, you got to give us a second. It's brand new. It's brand new. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Put on a blindfold and stick your hand in this box. What do you think it is? Well, <laughs> you're not doing any better than us. <laughs> and as you can see, people are not really willing to put their hands in that box blindfolded, are they? They're not no. really willing to do that. So. No. That, hey, that's a good analogy. I like that. Hmm. Yeah. So. Well, okay. So you were interested in science when you were young. You uh, you did all of this amazing biochem, um, and in pub now you're with public health. Can you talk to us about your current work? Yeah, sure. So what I do now is 
I no longer work in a lab. I did work in a lab, which was great. That was fun. That's the fun mm-hmm. stuff. That's what all the kids were. Did you work with animals and lab rats? So all the kids <laughs> always ask that when it's a career day. I'm like, yeah, I did. But I don't anymore. They're like, oh, man. Like, no, no, no. It's okay. It's still fun. <laughs> it's, it's still fun. So now I'm on the other side. So instead of being in a lab now, what I do is when a lab runs an experiment, they send the raw data to me. And so I take that raw data and I turn that raw data and crunch the numbers and all that kind of good stuff. And I turn it into a readable document that is more readily digestible for a non-science audience. So kind of like I was saying earlier, I make things easier to read. So if someone says, oh, can we talk about teratogenesis on here? People know what I'm talking about or changes in DNA and mutations. Okay. So let's just say I'm I'm exaggerating, right? To like a million, but let's just say. (laughs) There's a compound that um, a company wants to put into, I don't know, um, cereal. Let's just say, I don't know. But I'm exaggerating times a million, okay? I'm exaggerating. And it's a flavor enhancer, right? It's going to make your cereal taste like the best cereal ever. (laughs) But but if you eat it and you decide, and let's say you're a mommy. You're a mommy that eats it, and then you're having a baby, right? And your baby comes out and it has, instead of having two arms, it has four arms. Right. So now the little baby has extra arms, right? So, so you, your lucky charms weren't, weren't so lucky. Exactly. So those kinds of things are not advantageous. They're not good. It's not a positive result. So my job is to make sure that if that is the effect, I look at those effects. If the, if the chemical is going to cause a problem like that, I make sure to highlight that problem and say, hey, if you take this, here's what is possible well. After ingestion, okay, it might not be the best thing, but I'm again, that's a gross exa- exaggeration. But that's what I do. I make sure to check for things like that. Right, and there we're talking about risk mitigation and like small changes and prolonged exposure versus the amount of dose you're taking. All of that probably that is factoring exactly what we're talking about. And mm-hmm. let us remember: here's our first lesson, right? In tax, death is in the dosage. Anything in you know large amounts will take you out of here, right? So yeah. death is in the dosage. So it's important to understand, even though you're dealing with natural things, right? Even natural things can cause problems. Soya sauce. Soya sauce is deadly if you drink enough of it. Uh, did you know that arsenic is in apple seeds? <laughs> I did. But don't you have to eat like so many apples to, to die exactly. from it? Exactly. So you get it. <laughs> so you get it, right? Like, <laughs> eating too many apples can kill you, but like, hey, it's an apple. You know what I mean? You have to eat for it to hurt you. So, you know, things like Do that you- are important to understand. Do you help these labs make that decision through your communication? Like, okay, there's this risk, but the whatever it is, the cereal, people are only going to have a couple bowls a day. Um, So the risk is amplified at 100 bowls a day and really nobody's going to have that much cereal in a day. So like, is that is that also part of what you do is help? That is also part of what it's done. Yes, it is. Absolutely. So Hmm. if for some reason they say, you know, you need to eat 100 bowls of cereal, Every three hours for <laughs> ten days for this to happen, then clearly we know. Okay, well, this is not really a risk, is it? You no. know, because who's going to do that? I don't. That's a lot of cereal. <laughs> that's a lot of cereal. That's a lot of cereal, right? <laughs> like, if it takes that much cereal for this to happen, then it's not really a risk. Is the chemical <laughs> does it have the potential to be bad? Yeah, it does. But look at the risk versus the be- like. The risk cup is not full there, so it's okay. Eat the do you? Ah, I have another <laughs> follow up question. Um, do you feel a lot of pressure to catch that stuff? Like, man, yes. that's a lot of responsibility. I, oof. And that's when we have a team. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Like if it was just me and somebody sent me some data and like, hey, can you figure out what's going to happen when people eat this stuff? And I'd be like, ah, uh, I'd be like, just a, <laughs> I'd be a walking anxiety shaking, like stress. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's what's a team of us. Okay, and and cool. you know, we've been very, very successful at getting it right. Ah, <laughs> uh, Awesome. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that's in your profile and it's linked in your Twitter profile is uh, Stembacy. Did I say that correctly? Yes, Stembacy. Can you talk to us about Stembacy? It sounds really interesting. Yes, I love Stembacy. So Stembacy uh, and our tagline is where STEM ambassadors meet. So it literally is STEM ambassadors, people who are in every letter of the engram. So S-T-E-M. Um, so when you are a scientist 
a tech person, a engineer person, or a math person, whatever M, whatever letter you represent, you come onto the show. We it's like a video podcast or a, a vlog. Is that what the kids call it now? A vlog. So, <laughs> yeah, vlog. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, we interview different people. Oh, cool. Yeah, and we talked to them about about their work, kind of like what you and I are doing now. Yeah. And we talked about their work, what they do, why they love it, how they got into it, their background, their STEM story, if they have anything interesting going on. And we just really make it relatable so that people who think scientists are just like, you know, they look like Albert Einstein or <laughs> they're stuck in a like they're stuffy people. We kind of want to be relatable and let people know that scientists are real people and they do fun stuff. They're not just, you know, like yeah. we're lab rats, you know, but <laughs> we're still fun people. And so it's all about just showing the other side of STEM. I love it. That's cool. That's cool. And it's it's video, right? That's what you yeah. said? Yeah. Yeah. So no, we're on YouTube. So- it's on YouTube. I was going to ask, um, we'll have a link to it in the show notes. Um, uh, and I apologize. I didn't check it out. I thought it was, I'll cut this. I thought it was more of an organization than a, uh, well, it is, but then, a, than a show. That's amazing. I'm going to have to, I'll have to watch some episodes of that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And, and I think if your viewers are familiar, um, it is the brainchild of Raven, the science maven. Ah, it is. I love yeah. Raven. Yeah. She, okay. So then, yeah, you'll you'll love the show. It's, yeah, it's fun. yeah. She was on the podcast before. We she was Doctor Raven, the Science Maven. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. So for those of you listening, we'll have a link to Stembassy on YouTube, and I believe there's a Twitter page for it too. Yes, there is. There, it, it is at Stembassy, and um, season four is coming soon. We're on nice. season four right now. Do you, <laughs> off the top of your head, what are do you have some scientists that have like the names of some scientists that have been on it? Um, some big people, um, Hank Green. We had Hank Green. Oh, one. nice. Hank Green. Yeah. Good. <laughs> uh, Emily Calandretti. Oh um, yeah. Emily's awesome. Yeah. She's the space lady. She is. Yeah. We talked to her, uh, on the podcast like a year ago. It was right after, um, Emily's Wonder Lab had wrapped, which was Oh really, yeah. Which had which the was, baby. Yeah. She, yeah. She mm-hmm. had the baby by then. Yeah. She had the baby by then. Yeah. Yeah, so it's so. fun. We get to meet lots of cool people. It's really fun. <laughs> I really like it. She's a trooper to do that show. She was like eight or nine months pregnant. I can't. She was really imagine. pregnant. Yeah. I can't imagine. <laughs> what, like what an all star. That's that's yeah. ins- doing another show with another human inside you. Like that's that's a whole thing. And being <laughs> active. She was. Super I know. Active too. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, can you talk to us about this other project you're with, our other organization called Kindred Consulting? Yeah, so Kendra Consulting is uh, my baby, and basically it's taken my sitcom to another level. And what I decided to do is, I, I've written a children's book, I wrote it a few years ago. And so that children's book is called Noah the Little Scientist, mm-hmm. N-O-A, not with an H, and it's on Amazon. And it's about a little girl who discovers she wants to be a scientist, like her mom. It's very, very loosely based on me. <laughs> very, very loosely. <laughs> but um, it's about, you know, a kid that, wants to be a scientist she realizes it as she's moving through um a project with her classroom and her mom is a scientist and all kind of good stuff but so i've written a children's book i do sitcom i have stem and there's lots of things going on i get asked to do things in classrooms like scap a scientist i just signed on letters to a pre-scientist so there's lots of things that i'm doing and i also just landed a science writer position on a new science show that's coming out right i can talk too much about that but i decided to put it all in just in a company like you know what i'm doing it anyway so i turned it to my own little baby and it's my own little stem consulting company so if people want to reach out to me they want to work with me on a, um, a science concept or they want to do some work and trying to figure out how to make science more attainable how to be more engaging with their little ones with science they can reach out to me there we can start um working on those kind of projects together. Amazing. How do you have more time in the day than the average person? Like, do you, is there some kind of wormhole <laughs> operating around you that extends you to have like 37 hours to the day? This is, this is amazing. So, Congratulations. This is, <laughs> that's so I'm a cool. night owl. So things just come to me and I'm like, well, I'm doing it anyway. Why don't I just go ahead and <laughs> put it all on an umbrella and say, Hey, <laughs> So you're you're a writer for a science show. You can't. Is it? Is it? Is that? Are you in the hush hush development of it right now? Yes, I'm in the hush hush development of it, and I'm super excited. I'm super excited about it. I think it's going to be a really good show, and uh, um, I welcome more of those opportunities. I want to do that more. I wouldn't can, mind writing more um, scripts for science. When you can talk about it, can you tag our account? Is that possible? Sure, absolutely. Okay, I'd absolutely. love that. I'd love yeah. that. Then we yeah, could. I'm really excited. 
Okay, sweet. That's great. <laughs> I will give you the link to the website. Nice. And yeah, it's got the stuff that I've, that I've done in the past, what I've been doing. And if people want to work with me, they can click the link to contact me and say, <laughs> hey, I've got a project I want to work with you on. Let's, nice. let's talk about it. The other question we always ask our guests uh, for is, you know, it's kind of, this is the, this is the fluffy one, pun intended. Uh, is uh, the pet story. It, it allows our, our audience to get to know you. Like you said, it's some scientists are, are normal people. Um, do you have a pet story from your life you could share with us? I do. And you know what? I'm, I'm so excited to tell you this because no one believes me when I tell them, right? No <laughs> okay. So my, do- my dog, unfortunately, I have a cat, um, but my, my dog, unfortunately, has, uh, has crossed the Rainbow Bridge. And, oh, okay. I'm sorry to yeah. hear that. But when he was here, he's my baby. And so um, I let him out back, of course, to go, you know, handle his business. <laughs> and um, and there was a fox outside. I didn't know. Oh, no. And so, and it's nighttime, of course. And so I have the, the deck light is on, but I can't see the fox. So, but my dog, and he's, um, he was the last one absent. So he's a small dog, smaller breed dog. Perfect little snack, right? And yeah. so he, he's walking out, you know, to the yard and he stops. And I'm like, you know, go on. And he, he just freezes. And I'm like, go on, like, <laughs> hurry up so we can go back inside. And I don't see anything. He just stops. And then I hear this, arf, arf. Have you ever heard of a fox before? They they make like a, well, some of them make like squeaky sounds. Some make like a weird kind of bark sound. Yeah. Yeah, like a weird bark. And I just like, arf. I'm like, arf. Like, what, what is that? And then I see <laughs> It steps into the light and I see the eye, you know, the how the animal eyes glow at nighttime when the light hits it. Yeah. I was like, what is that? And it just started barking. I'm like, oh, it's just a dog. Because of course, it's, to me, like, it's a funny sounding dog, but whatever. But then I saw the tail and I said, oh, it's a fox. And so it started coming closer to my dog. And I just, I panicked. I went into full mama bear mode and I <laughs> ran down that deck and I was like, you get away from my dog. <laughs> And so I'm standing in between a fox and my dog. <laughs> did the fox stand its ground or did it get out of there? Yes. Yes. And so it's standing there and I'm like, I should be terrified. Yeah. And I'm not. I'm like, you get away from me, you dog. And so, <laughs> I mean, I mean, you fox and leave my dog alone. And so it didn't move. What? <laughs> I'm sorry. This is not. I know it's not as funny as I'm making, but to me, it's funny now. So it wouldn't. It wouldn't move. So I started barking like a really big dog. <laughs> and, <laughs> did it move after that? Yes. Oh, I, the- I kind of like lunged at it a little bit and made myself like a. You're like, all right, going yes, out of it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Now that would be terrifying to a fox. Like, like the humans don't normally sound like that. Oh my god! <laughs> nobody believes nobody believes me. So my neighbor, the next day after the talk, she goes, "You know, what were you doing outside?" <laughs> and I told her, were you losing your mind like, outside? What were you going bananas? Like the other, your neighbor probably was worried about you. <laughs> <laughs> she heard the commotion but didn't know what it was. And so when I told her, she goes, "Did you really charge at a fox?" And I said, "Yeah." She said, like, "Could have had rabies." I said, "I don't care. It's going to eat my baby." <laughs> I don't that have you. So I don't know if I've ever heard of like a fox attacking a human. I I did not. I think they're pretty the, timid. I had no idea. All I know <laughs> is my dog was scared to handle his business because there's this fox out there. And when <laughs> I went out there, I fully expected this animal to run, and it did it. It didn't is, run. I'm like, you should run. Wild. Get out of here! Right now. <laughs> that is wild. It ended well, though. It ended well. It That's ran good. away. Yeah, but that is, I mean, it's, to me, it's hilarious. Now I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, what if it had rabies? Oh my gosh. But I didn't care in the moment. My baby. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Can you imagine if somebody ta- put that on TikTok? Like you'd be, uh, <laughs> how many million views would that be? But look, and the funny part is they wouldn't get the first part. They would only show the part me barking like a dog. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was your dog's name? Marco. Aw. What kind of, yeah. what kind of, what kind of breed was Marco or was it kind of a mix? He was a lasso abso. Oh, cute. Like, like the little shih tzu cousin. They look yeah. alike. But yeah, he's a lasso. Ah. <laughs> yeah. We've had to, uh, like, we live in rural Alberta, Canada, so we have, like, some sketchy wildlife sometimes. So we worry about, I worry about coyotes with our dogs. Um, oh, I've seen, really? yeah, I've seen foxes before, uh, but they're, like, they, they run away. Uh, coyotes sometimes stand their ground, and that's, they're they're kind of sketchy that way, so. Really? Yeah. <laughs> are they now? Are they 
Are they bigger than I've seen the comparison with how big wolves are, but are coyotes that big or are they just kind of in between a dog and a wolf? They're kind of in between, like they're way bigger than your dog, right? Like a fox, you'd say like a a normal size fox is maybe twice the size of a house cat, maybe like they don't get crazy big. Um, A big coyote is maybe the size of a golden retriever. So they can get pretty big. Um, But the scary thing is they, unlike foxes, coyotes work in packs like wolves. Um, So they're usually not alone. Um, And that's what's, that's what's uh, sometimes the problem with coyotes. Oh, wow. (laughs) <laughs> but having talked to you if i yeah. do see one i'm gonna bark like a dog and charge i don't it. recommend that at all no i'm, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding <laughs> oh my God. people are gonna hear this and be like she's crazy <laughs> no they're gonna love what it would you do? what would you do if it was your baby uh, would you i would i would i would save my dogs absolutely <laughs> yeah I talked to another guest from Florida and they were like, uh, their, their pet story was the dog got to a crocodile or an alligator. I forget which one of the twos lives in Florida. Um, I came out of the water and they were like ready to like tackle this massive rep- reptile to save their dog. So they're just like our, you know, there are, there are fur, fur babies. So they're my fur, yeah. My fur yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing your pet story that I, I, I had tears coming out of the side of my eyes. <laughs> Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> the other uh, the other question we ask our guests uh for is the super fact and the super fact is something that you know that when you tell people it kind of like blows their mind a bit um do you, do you have a super fact for us so i have um i have idiosyncrasies right i have a couple of them but but the one that i think people really really are just like what like you're a weirdo and i'm okay i, I own it i own it right <laughs> so Pen caps. I do not like to write with a pen that does not have a cap on it. Oh, really? And yeah, and I'm not. You gotta take them to, off. You gotta take them off. I gotta put them on. It has oh, to have you, a cap. Oh, it has to have a cap. Oh, yes. Okay. So, and, and even when, let's I, if I'm at the, um, I'm also an adjunct faculty member. So, when I'm even teaching on campus, even the dry erase markers, I have to replace the. <laughs> I take the cap off the front, obviously, and put it on the back end. And if I don't have it, it really, like, it bothers me. I don't know why, but it I will not write with it. You mm-hmm. know, you go to the bank and they have those pens on the chain. I hate those. I hate them. <laughs> those are the worst. The, do you, are, do they still exist? Yes. But then oh, now man. when the ink runs out, they just, you know, now they have the little, the little bowl of pens or whatever. But in some places they remove all the caps off the end. I'm just like, I can't, I can't. <laughs> And I'll ask someone, like, do you have a, a pen that has a cap on it? And if I change purses where I have my pen, sometimes, you know, well, ladies change purses, right? So if I change purses and don't put a pen on my purse, it, it gets really aggravating. Because I'm like, I have to ask someone for a pen with a cap. And they're like, <laughs> what, lady? I'm like, please. And if they don't have one, it just, ugh, ugh, it bothers <laughs> me. I don't know why it bothers me so much, but it does. But yeah, you- that's that's my my, my fact. Every everything like that, I'm sure there's some kind of scientific name for it. Um, yeah, so it's know. it's just out there somewhere. Yeah. Oh, you want a part two to that? Okay, sure. So here's, part, here's part two. I right? I am just enjoying this is this is a highlight of my day just listening to you talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, pen cap. So I have to the pen cap, but also I don't like um those fine tip pen. I don't like the fine tips because they I like a ballpoint pen. Where it has to like roll over the so like paper. gel tips like those ones that are really sharp. You don't like no those. gel tips, no gel tip pens, no fine tip. I want a, a regular ballpoint ink pen <laughs> that it's it smoothly flows over the paper. And a whole pack of pens will last me at least a year because I I use one pen until all the ink runs out. I don't use the next pen until the first one is done. I and would I send use- you some Bunsen and Beaker pens because uh, we have Bunsen and Beaker pens, but they, they're they the clicky ones at the end. They don't have a cap. There's no pen cap? Oh, my no, God. No, so I can't. I was going to say they're they're ni- really nice ballpoint pens, but they don't have a cap. <laughs> I want to say thank you so much. I'm like, mm-mm. No, no, it's me- okay. I get it. I get it. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, I use the same. It lasts me forever because... I don't use the next pen until the uh, the first one and the ink has to run all the way down. If oh. it doesn't, I'll keep using it. Mm. I'm a weirdo. I own it. It's okay. 
No, there's <laughs> everybody has things that do make them crazy. Um, I am, I do not like clowns and, uh, I'm a high school chemistry teacher. Like I teach high school sciences. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I teach physics sometimes too. So I, all of my problems in physics and kinematics are running away from clowns, you know, trying to escape the deadly clowns, your acceleration, you know, all of that kind of like easy first level physics stuff where you can do distances and speeds. Um, and the kids are like so sick of clowns by the end of it. But I think I hopefully I've put a healthy respect of clowns into them. That's my goal. <laughs> so can I ask you a question with this? I have two. Sure. Okay. The first one is um, the easy one, right? So you teach physics, like you like physics on purpose. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like, I like that. I like the hands on uh, aspect of some of the more introductory physics. Um, it gets, you really have to uh, like that world of physics if you're getting into like theoretical stuff because you can't do that necessarily with your hands. You have to like crunch the numbers, right? Mm, yeah. Okay. So that that aspect of teaching I love where we're like racing cars and calculating friction coefficients and things like that. That's fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Charlie Brown's teacher. Like what? <laughs> Some kids don't get it either, but they really like racing cars. <laughs> that sounds familiar. Okay, my other one is the clown. What happened? I don't know. I just don't like them. They, they, I think maybe there was one at a birthday party when I was young, and they're just like, you know how some kids, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this, they, they take the kids to see Santa Claus, and the kids lose their mind because Santa yeah. Claus to them is so weird. Yeah. <laughs> Or the Easter Bunny. The Easter Bunny is terrifying when you think of it. Some human-sized giant rabbit. Go sit on its lap, you know? Oh, my God. <laughs> that does sound, the way you describe it, that does sound kind of weird. So okay. Yeah, so I think that's what happened to me. And it's not like I'm going to run away from a clown or I can't watch, like, Stephen King's It. Um, but I just don't like them. If I see one, I am not going to go near it. Um, no. <laughs> wow. Okay. And that's just that's become a fun thing in physics where... All of the physics problems revol revolve around clowns. <laughs> That's funny. I bet you they like that too. They do. They do. I think by the end of it, they're like, can we have something other than clowns? I'm like, no. That's when the clowns <laughs> get you. As soon as you stop paying attention to them, that's when they get you. So that's we're not doing you. that. We're not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Well, this, is, this, this, little, this little section here <laughs> went off the rails, but I'm glad that it did. Um, <laughs> 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 Thanks for sharing your super fact. We've had some super... Super, super facts in this area. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the last the last part of the podcast is a fun one. Um, we get to talk about things that are really important to our guests, maybe outside of what they're doing with their job. Um, some guests talk about their hobbies or causes. You wanted to talk about a public health show? Did yes, I get that right? Okay. You did. K talk, talk to me about this. I'd love to know sure, more. Sure. Sure. So... I think that when it comes to SciComm, I'm pretty decent at SciComm, right? I think when I say things, people get it. They understand <laughs> what I'm talking about. I would really, really love to take what I do and have it on screens in households across the world, all around the globe. Oh. I think it's super important that we... So my doctor degree studied um, global health, right? So I was a global health uh, nut. Well, I am a global health nut. And I think that... If I could do my own show, it would be... Are you familiar with um, Lisa Ling? Uh, no, I'm would not. I'm sorry. Back explore? Okay. Um, what about... Um, no Reservations? I have heard of that, yes. Okay. Yes. So think No Reservations as far as the... With Anthony Bourdain, right? So so that, yep. um, that in-your-face culture, food, the people and whatnot. And then I guess the anthropology or the investigative journalism portion with Lisa Ling, so the serious side. And then me and my vivacious personality, <laughs> and my, my relatability to people. And if you put that into a ball and shook it up and then just dumped the contents out, what you would get would be someone who is a scientist that is investigating infectious diseases oh that'd be so interesting yeah so interesting, right communicable diseases non-communicable diseases around the world and then getting to the stem so talking about 
the STEM concepts behind those diseases, like what it is, how it got here and what's happening in your body and how we can prevent the spread. And then also giving some historical context. Okay, well, how did we get here? How did this happen? And then wrapping it all up by talking to other public health specialists in the area and taking a look at what they're doing on the ground and how we can kind of put a cap on incidence rates and and bring things down to a, uh, a workable level and maybe eradication. But, you know, things like that are what I want to talk about. And I want to go to different countries and talk mm-hmm. about these things that are specific to those countries. Right. Like you could go to, I believe there's still places in the world's <laughs> tiny pockets where polio still exists. I could be wrong about this. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And that would be fascinating. Like this disease. Yep. Polio, that, tuberculosis. TB, tuber- mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, all of that. That is so cool. I would love to do it. So And and you'd also have to tell us about the local food, like Bourdain show too, right? Exactly. Talk to the local people. Yeah. Okay, this is a great place. This is what they're dealing with. This is how we, you know, dig into things. So if you're listening, History Channel, Discovery, (laughs) Matt and Janelle, if you guys are listening, Science Channel. (laughs) (laughs) Couple of those things follow up, Bunsen and Beaker, I think. Our Twitter accounts got pretty good reach. Yay! (laughs) <laughs> okay, so now I'm really amplifying. So if you guys are listening, there's going to be a link to my webpage. Talk to me. Send me a line. Let's have a conversation. Yeah, it's just as easy as moving your finger down and clicking on it on your phone. Like, don't do that while you're driving uh, Discovery <laughs> Channel, right? We don't want to lose Discovery Channel. But, like, pull off to the side of the road, you know, finish your text to History Channel, and then click on um, click on the link there. <laughs> mm-hmm. let's make it happen i'm excited people need to see that they need to see the humanity of people too i think a lot of times when we think about diseases and we look at things that other countries are dealing with we lose the humanity in that you know and mm-hmm. we don't see people as actual people so i think that's important too no especially with uh covid right like mm-hmm. deaths and cases have just been turned into numbers and those exactly. numbers represent people and it's like so people. dehumanizing i think well all right. Well, I wish you the best of luck for that. Um, Thank you. If anything comes down the pipe that you need our big Twitter account's help with, just let me know. Um, one of the goals of our account is to promote science and to pr- pr- maybe to promote underrepresented voices and, and people that I think probably the world would love to see on a bigger platform. And, and we'd love to do help you with that if that ever if that ever happens. So let us know. That is so exciting. And thank you so much for that. <laughs> I have a couple more questions before we end, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. What, one is about, okay, it's about your your profile on Twitter. Yeah. You're at G underscore protein. Um, yes. Can, can, you, can you tell us the story behind that? Yeah. So everyone knows that G protein kind of runs everything, right? Yeah. G protein runs everything. And so if you don't have a G protein, you kind of don't really exist the way you should in the world like g (laughs) proteins do everything in your body they're responsible for all kinds of membrane receptors if you're a eukaryote and if you're a human being then yeah you're eukaryote so you got them right (laughs) yeah if you're a eukaryote you need it yeah yeah so you got them and and you know if if you don't have you have to have it something that you have to have in your life and so if you'll be functional if you want to be happy and healthy and able to do what you got to do you need G protein. And I think that me as G protein, I think I help keep people happy and healthy and functional. <laughs> G protein. <laughs> you need me in your life. <laughs> I love it. And the other question is, um, you've been on a couple, like uh, some fairly big TV programs, channels slash things. Um, is there, interview. what's that? Interview. Yeah. Yeah. You've been yeah. interviewed, right? Yeah. 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 Um, the, is the, there the just side. before, yeah. Just before we close, is there one, from is there one story from that that you'd like to share with us? I, I just I would love to hear one if you can remember if you feel comfortable sharing. So basically, um, the interview was about me as a scientist and what I do, and mm. we just talked about kind of what we're doing right now. But it was just um, I was asking them questions about being a scientist, and I answered them. They were like, "This is really great," and then boom, there you go. It was really simple. It mm. was really um, it was fun to do, and it was so. Can I tell you a secret? Okay, sure. <laughs> it wasn't as fun as this, though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this was this was much more fun. But yeah, it was just a simple um, 
question and answer session. Are okay, you a cool. scientist? Yes, this is what I do. <laughs> um, so we're at the end of our chat, unfortunately. Um, I mean, I would oh, love to hear more of your stories. Yeah. This is <laughs> fun. You're an absolute, uh, absolute master at storytelling. Um, so I can see why SciComm just is a great fit for you. We've talked about many places that people can find you. Uh, the last, the last thing I guess, is there a main place that people can contact you through? Like, is there, is there like one that's like your home base? Uh, if people want to get a hold of you, if they want to get a hold of me and I'll drop you the link, you'll have the link from me. Um, they can go to the webpage. If they want to talk to me about working on projects or even things like, um, getting me to their classroom. I, I said earlier that I actually got matched with the classroom. I'm doing Skype a scientist and I just finished the training for letters to a pre-scientist. So I do things like that also. That's so if awesome. you want me to come to your classroom and drop in, or if you want to work on a project with me, <laughs> to have a science show, you need a script written, <laughs> reach out to me. And I might, personally, I might reach out to you to come to talk to my, my class because the, the, my day job is a, as a high school teacher. So Sure. <laughs> sure. I'll just have to get the time zones down. That's all. <laughs> we do because you're in Canada, right? Yeah, we're mountain time. Um, you're two hours ahead of us. You're two hours okay. in the future. Yeah, it's okay, not too yeah. bad. It's not insurmountable like the guest I spoke to from Poland this morning. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, they're like uh, 18 hours uh, ahead or something like that. So they're in not, not quite that. No, I'm sorry. Not quite that far, like seven or eight hours ahead. Yeah. <laughs> well, this has been an absolute treat to talk to you today. Thank you so much. Just from the bottom of my heart, giving up your time to talk to the Science Podcast about your area of science uh, your awesome pet story um i've had so much fun thank you thanks so much i really appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk to you this is really fun okay it's time for story time with me adam if you don't know what story time is story time is when we talk about stories that have happened within the past one or two weeks dad do you have a story my story is about when it's cooler so bunsen is really enjoying the weather and he's really enjoying the walks there's a time in the summer where he kind of refused to go for walks. I think it was too hot and he was really uncomfortable. Now now he's good to go because this is like his time to shine and it's almost going to snow. And I get to go too. Yeah, and Chris has been coming. That's great. We'll see how long that lasts. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> That's a little rude. So when the dogs are in the forest, they now play forest tag with each other. And I, I swear one of these days it's going to end badly. Somebody's going to fall in a ravine. They're going to get stabbed on a fallen tree. But the dogs chase each other and parkour over everything in the forest. And I need to get it on tape one of these days. Some days they do it, some days they don't. So it's kind of unexpected. They're just like, ha. Huh. And, and, and I don't know who's going to start it. Sometimes it's Beaker that starts it. Sometimes it's Bunsen. And they zippity doo dah around the forest, jumping over logs. And, and you'd think that Bunsen can't move very fast. He's like, oh, he's a big tank guy. And he pretends he's really slow. No, he's, to he's fast. He can jump over trees. That are falling down, not over tops of trees. Um, and he's just as fast as Beaker. He's smarter than Beaker at like triangulating where she's going to go, but she's way faster than him. So it's a war of wits and brains versus speed. And that's the force tag story. All right, back to you, Adam. All right, it's time for my story. And my story is fantastic. I have hair all over me now. Um, my story is amazing. So I was on the couch. I was watching Parks and Recreation, uh -huh. um, a really good show. Hey, so basically I was watching Parks and Rec, and then I look over to the turtle, and he's like, because he's got to get on his rock, and he's got little talons. <laughs> he does. And he's climbing onto his rock, and then he goes, and I'm like, okay, funny turtle noises. And then I hear a, and then... I look over and I'm like, what the heck happened here? <laughs> it's like when Ant-Man returns from, uh, like, Endgame spoilers. I mean, if you haven't watched it, get ready to have spoilers. Um, it's when Ant-Man returns. He's like, what the heck happened here when oh, yeah. everyone's gone? After the snap. After the snap. Anyways, I look behind. I look over there and I'm like, where's the turtle? <laughs> I look in the turtle tank and there's no one there. I look on his little perch and there's no one there. So I take a double. I, I like. I take a double take. I step back and then look back and then I hear a, I hear a <laughs> from behind the tank and the turtle's struggling to even move. And I call mom and dad over. Mom, dad, the turtles fell. And then dad's like, "What?" And I'm like, "The the, the turtle fell." And um, 
Of course we don't believe Adam. Well, I don't because he always tells me, Mom, your turtle's dead. I couldn't piece it through my head how the turtle fell out of the tank. <laughs> the turtle, like, phased through the wall of the tank and fell in behind. And it was stuck there. And then, <laughs> and then we had to go get him. I think he just shelled up and then fell and he was fine. Oh, yeah, he fell and he just, like... <laughs> Yeah. He just fell down like Plinko. Mikey, I will rip you out of your shell. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so today I was watching the turtle like a hawk going, what are you doing, turtle? So what he, what I saw is the dock and then the outlet of the filter are closer together because I'm not sure why, but Duncan and I spent some time um, moving over a thousand liters of water um, this past weekend. And maybe I, maybe the dock got moved closer to the filter or something. So he sticks one leg on the dock, the floating dock, and then he sticks the other leg on the outlet and then he shoves himself up a little bit and then shoves himself up a little bit. But ha ha, I have blocked the exit to the tank. So Carl and or Sagan can't get out. Um, yeah. Mom, do you have a story other than the information that you've given us about the, the turtle case? Well, it was a pretty exciting story. The case of the how the turtle got out. Um, super sleuth. Population me. Um, anyway, so my other story has to do with Bunsen. Now, he's been Mr. Toddler Time every night this week, and it's escalating. It's like instead of Beaker Intensifies, it's Bunsen Toddler Time escalates. Last night, we were listening to Karina Newsome on Spaces, and uh, her stories just made me really, really emotional. She talked about uh, a story with her cat. Um, and as someone who had a cat that was over 20 years old, like it's just that bond is unbelievable. And then she was sharing some other stories about about her research. And just I was like, feeling really, really sad. Uh, but happy, sad at the same time. And then she was talking about um, her accomplishments, and it was just, it was just great all the way around. So I was kind of, kind of just feeling a little verklempt, and Bunsen was feeling a little verklempt, and so we were just having toddler time together, and it was a good bonding uh, session for Bunsen and I. And if I just pet him, he stopped crying, and he's just pet me, pet me. So. That's my story. So that's the end of story time. I can't wait to see you guys on the next podcast uh, episode. Bye-bye. That's the end of this week's podcast episode. Thanks for coming back week after week to listen to us. Special thanks to our expert guest this week, Dr. Chanel Tolson. Man, I had so much fun talking with this guest. Uh, she's so bubbly and fun and so smart. We'd also like to thank our top tier patrons on Patreon. Without their support... We wouldn't be able to do what we do and grow our show. Take it away, Chris. Chris Kelly, Samantha Dodd, Kimberly Bond, Nate Stephenson, Debbie Anderson, Courtney Proven, Renee Hardy, Mary Ryder, Shelby Leggett, Dan Fry, Mary Coos, Kat Lynch, Marianne McNally, Andrea Persons, Elizabeth Bourgeois, Karen Beth St. George, Bianca Hyde. Leela Perillo, Lynn Armstrong, Lisa Swartz, Catherine Jordan, Donna Craig, Lila Ashier, Jody Ogren, Liz Button, Kathy Zerker, and Ben Rathard. For science, empathy, and cuteness. Yep, so